some of them are doing quite well and they're basically taking home content and licensing it for display yeah. outside of the home and they are doing things around like corporate events birthday parties mm -hmm. and things like that um, and then all the way down to pod level stuff where it could be a three off experience inside a pod stuff being done in 40x chairs and things like that mm -hmm. so um, the the whole ecosystem of LB is, is really quite broad I think folks who aren't used to this space would be surprised it's it's fairly broad in price point it's fairly broad in demographic uh, it's fairly broad in complexity and technological input so um, I, I don't want to give the impression that what's on this panel is typical of the whole market I'm curious from the room how many of you guys have been to a VR location based experience oh, okay cool. awesome yeah. okay, very um, familiar here I mean I think you'll you'll hear some naysayers say um, that location-based experience is a short-term fix for the lack of headsets out at home and in the home space and that uh, VR is really not going to hit scale until we get to that point where everyone at home can put on a headset and experience something there. So kind of the question to you, because I'm sure you guys all have thought about it, how do you build a sustainable business model in a place where uh, we are still in the infancy stage of VR headsets, and as more devices, whether they be glasses, phones, um, headsets, become more equipped with XR capabilities, how you are going to draw people into an LBE. And I think you guys have mentioned a few of that, but how do you build a sustainable market, not just for the short term, but for um, the long term? Well, um, I'll just jump in. I think, you know, we, I, I look at the market. I look at when I you know I hear people talk about VR and LBE. I think okay, there's the way we we break it into formats, and honestly, we we're having to create formats, and a format is how you might experience the content. Could be a um, you know football field size attraction, or it could be something that's small, like maybe like what you're seeing with Dreamscape doing. It's you know a little space like this, right? Or or the whole range of things in between. So there's a format. There's how you interact with stuff. Um, and then the business model that's tied to that, right? So that, those are like the factors. Uh, and not all VR is equal, like we just expressed. We did a show, for example, in uh, National, with National Geographic. We put 400 people paying customers in the audience with a live performer on stage. Uh, and um, they went on a journey with this explorer to all these amazing places around the world. You know, Antarctica with penguins and Greenland and Nepal. and. And um, we took a survey, 98% of people in the audience had never tried VR. Um, and it was really a you know, 360 video mm -hmm. with the live performer element, and that was pretty amazing. Um, so you know, I think there are different formats that are being created, and around those formats are the business models. We're choosing to go high-end, not arcade, um, partly because, and we could be wrong, I think the consumer market will catch up with a lot of what you see out there today. Uh, and it'll become like not worth paying 20 bucks for. Um, so we have to create experiences that you can only do outside of the house, and that might include things that you could never put in your house. And so that's kind of how we go about designing the nuts and bolts of what supports our experiences. Sure. I can, I, uh, just to add to that, yeah. So I, I, I completely agree that I don't think the LBE is competing with home VR. At least not the high end that, that Shiraz and I are doing because you will never have a motion based platform in your home. You'll never have a fan that's you know procedurally driven. You will never have uh, you know misters. You will never have all of this stuff. This will be the most intense version of VR. Um, the full promise of VR will really only ever be delivered in experiences like what we're building. Um, and quite frankly, this is just personal, it's not pneumatic. I, I don't really see VR taking off in large numbers in the home. I think this AR is where it takes off. And so what we're promising is it's not really in competition with a home, much in the same way the arcade market was basically a GPU competition. And once the PlayStation 2 showed up, arcades just sort of withered on the vine. So I actually don't think there's, um, there's actually head-to-head -head competition on the tech side. In terms of the content side, um, I don't want to sidetrack us into a larger sort of discussions on trends in video gaming, but I'll just leave folks with one, one fact. Um, when I was at EA in 2007, we published about 55 games. Last year, EA, console games, uh, last year EA published, I believe, eight. And their stock has never been higher. Uh, and that's because EA, like most game publishers, has figured out how to have a longer revenue relationship with the player, rather than just getting $60 once every Q3. Um, that's what we've got to learn, or otherwise we're just gonna be a turnstile business. So um, 
you know, again, don't want to sidetrack into what all the strategies would be, but uh, certainly have a longer, deeper relationship with the customer beyond just the single walk through the turnstile is going to be, I think, vital to the success of any LBE business. You know, I'd just throw out there that, you know, home VR versus out of home VR is a little bit like comparing, you know, a bottle of gin and a martini in a bar, right? <laughs> you know, you can have the bottle of gin at home and it's a different experience, you know, like you at home, you're, you know, you're in public, you're going to have your friends with you. You've got the whole pageantry of the, you know, the creation of the drink and sitting at the bar. And so I, I think they, they really are just fundamentally different things. Um, what, let's talk about content because I see a few folks here from the content world. What kind of content are you guys looking for? Are you guys creating your own original IP? Are you looking to bring content in? How do you want to work with content players? And you know, we're talking about a new industry, a new ecosystem here. So how do we green, you know, what's on your wish list, yeah. right, to bring up the whole ecosystem? I got one thing. Uh, uh, <laughs> I should have a lot. Wish list. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, for folks who already have VR content that's for the home, uh, in out of home, you're looking for shorter and simpler. You know, in, you are a different person in public than when you're at home, right? When you're at home, you're comfortable, you've got, you know, your couch, you can stay there for a long time, you'll read instructions, you, you're a different person. In public, you've got a drink, you're on a date, you've got, you're, you've got a colleague, you know, you, you have different, your, your, your time is valued differently. And, and so a game that is an incredible five hours of, game, of play at home really wants to be five minutes with a really simple menu and, and you're up and running super quickly and I don't need a staff member there to train you for a long time. Uh, so, so for folks moving from, out, from, from home content to out of home content, go simple. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a good point. I think, you know, the other thing that considers study um, the locations of where you're putting this stuff. So we, we spend a lot of time studying consumer um, behavior, whether it's in China or here in the U.S. or somewhere else, and in specific locations. And you'll even see, like, you know, um, like even between Disney parks, they have return customer um, ratios are very different for the same attraction in the two different parks based on the type of people that go to California versus Florida for vacation. And so, you know, like in our some of our China installations, you know, we have customers that are coming. It's like their only time in their life that they'll get to go on a vacation. Um, and our partner and investor there, 23, 25 million people now a year coming through these parks, and a majority of them are this is their one big trip. And so, so I think understanding your customer helps you design whether or not the experience needs to be playable again or not, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that there's, that's an important decision to make early on is like, do we need to create content that can be played by the same local population over and over to be successful? Or is it for the once in a, you know, every few year, once in a lifetime traveler? And so that's, that's also important into your business model calculation. I think also one important thing, obviously here in LA, is the, you know, the, that that balance between really big IP that might drive people just by you know the the known factor, versus you know it doesn't have to be versus you know but and um, really exciting interesting content that was specifically made for v, for VR and it's going to really pop in a much you know much more interesting way. I went um, to the IMAX VR this weekend with my brother. Um, was our, the sec he was visiting in town. And I took him there for the second time. And we we did Life of Us, um, and it was it was you know he's not in this business he's a professor, and you know last time we'd gone there we'd done he'd done Star Wars right and so he and his reaction was wow that you know when I did Star Wars that was a game, Life of Us really was something different it wasn't a game it wasn't a movie it was an experience it was something completely different so. I would think, it, as you know, as a marketer, probably that many people might go to a place like that, either for the tech or for the big titles like the Star Wars, like Spider Man. Mm -hmm. But then, when if they actually have the opportunity to try something that's unique and different, and probably made for specifically VR, you know, like Life of Us and great uh, LA company and what you guys, what you guys are all creating, that might be what has much more repeatability and much more sustaining, sustaining interest for 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 cu customers. Yeah, and I think I think the other sorry, Go just ahead. one other thought, and um, we're you know in this phase of selling what we're making to customers, you know, behind closed doors, and a lot of our customers are commercial real estate partners, um, you know, uh, mall, theme park, you name it, and so um, you know I, I will say that the the content thing, whether you have Hollywood IP or 
new IP or whatever. It's really about, I go back to my earlier comment about the experience and how you adapt whatever it is to make mm -hmm. something really remarkable and memorable. Yeah. And I can say that most of our um, partners are looking for something that you know, feels really special and amazing. And if it happens to be a movie IP or something great, they also want to see that translate well. Like you're capturing, you know, we like to say the ultimate wish fulfillment of the IP, whatever it is, to bring that to life and deliver that to the fans. And if you do that, you're doing your job right. If you don't, it's, it, it falls flat. And so I think mm -hmm. in the IP selection, it's what IP can translate well to location base that furthermore could never be brought to life in the way that you only could do you know, versus having it at home. And so I think yeah. that's important to consider an IP selection is who you're selling to mm -hmm. and what they need to see. You know, I might also throw out on the IP one because I think it's an interesting, especially when you're talking about new tech and new play models. You know, there was a lot of GPS-enabled smartphone games before Pokemon Go. But, you know, when you're, when you're talking about bringing people both something new, a new way to play, and a new IP, it's sort of like you have to train them twice. And, and I think that part of the success for, for Pokemon Go was people knew Pokemon and they were like, hey, I love Pokemon. Oh, okay, I'll try this new thing. But, but you know, for the earlier GPS-enabled games, they sort of had a, a big road to toe mm -hmm. in training people on a new way to play and training them on a new world for, to, you know, to introduce them to. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I agree with Shiraz, you know, as, as you start to figure, figure out, you know, what content to put on here, it might be that, for, particularly for some new technologies, uh, you know, a an IP that's a good fit for that uh, helps to kind of reduce the, the, yeah. the maybe the hesitation and the unknown aspect of to bring of people the in the door the first time, right? Exactly, and then maybe right. they'll try some of the other some ones of the other stuff. once they're yeah. engaged. But that's a great point around marketing, right? And I think oftentimes people don't talk about marketing enough because.